Hi everybody, we might kick off. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I've got to say this is like uh, pretty much about 30 more people than we thought we'd have here, so it's really awesome. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm Cameron Slatcher. I'm one of the conveners of the, the session together with uh, Piers Higgs up the back, uh, Tanya Lati right up the back. Uh, who's looking really stressed because she's been in charge of uh, uh, kind of trying to wrangle uh, our virtual presence over all the last uh, seven, seven hours or so. And we've also got uh, Andrew Rodriguez online uh, from GBIF as the other convener. Um, so I'll kick off uh, and just start by, uh, if I could go to the next slide, please. Um, just acknowledging the Uinina people, uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to Aboriginal elders, past and present. We respect all Tasmanian Aboriginal people, their culture and their rights as the first peoples of Eritruita. Sorry, I'm used to Canberra and the traditional owners there. We also acknowledge all First Nations people involved in or watching this workshop. Um, next slide, please. I'm to put this so I can actually read my notes while I'm talking. Sorry. Um, so approaches, as most of you know, approaches to sensitive or restricted access biodiversity data have been around for several decades. Um, the, growth, the growth of biodiversity data aggregators, citizen science projects over the past uh, 20 years or so has led to an exponential expansion uh, in application of big data to conservation assessment. Cheers. Ah, <laughs> um, uh, many organisations uh, have applied data restrictions of various types and there continue to be uh, calls for freer access to data. But, but basically, the motivations of individuals, researchers and organisations in restricting access to certain types of data have pretty much remained constant. Uh, there's those in favour, those opposed, but the basic reality is a lot of institutions are restricting access to a certain proportion of their data and that is not likely to change the behaviour in the near future. Um, data producers, data custodians of, generally have a more conservative view of access than data consumers. Um, there are issues including the type and level and th threat vulnerability, vulnerability uh, type of information and public availability. Additionally, there's a growing recognition of the need to enable Indigenous peoples and local communities to assert da data sovereignty over traditional knowledge and biodiversity data gathered about by or within areas managed by them. Two of the most recent attempts to deal with the overlapping issues in the space have been uh, Arthur Chapman's um, 2023 current best, best practice guidelines for generalising sensitive species occurrence data. <sighs> Uh, and an attempt in Australia to develop a standardised national framework for the sharing of restricted access species data in Australia. And I'll talk why we, I'll mention why we talk about restricted access data in Australia in a moment or in, are intending to. 
Um, the focus of this workshop is just to try to move the dialogue along a bit. Um, uh, there's been a lot of publications over the last 20 years which, which keep talking about what we should be doing in this space and standardising what we're doing in this space. And the purpose of this workshop is really to try to start move to, moving towards some outcomes. Oh, am I pressing the wrong button or? Oh. Cool. Um, except that my notes don't move on at the same speed, which is a bit silly. So um, approaches to uh, restricted access biodiversity data have been many and varied for many years. Um, I've already talked about the workshop progressing um, the agenda. Um, what we're really trying to do is uh, discuss, uh, generate some discussion and possible endorsement of the metadata recommendations made by Arthur in his uh, 2023 paper, um, discuss and try to endorse approaches to managing restricted access data such as generalisation and the proposal for a global sensitive species list. Um, and we also want to try to produce a, a, a report based on the work the workshop discussions that we have this evening um, that requests had we to consider adopting a restricted access data extension to Darwin Core, and if adopted, that can be uh, endorsed by TADWIG and organisations such as GBIF and the Atlas of Living Australia and tabled with international conservation organisations and agencies to start working towards a global approach. Um, so we did ask everybody to kind of read the attachments that we circulated before the report, and I'm sure you've all done it. Um, I bet no one has because I didn't. But uh, but really to, to kind of just sort of introduce the other, what, what, some of the, what uh, Andrew and uh, Piers are going to be talking about and what we'll be talk, talking about in terms of general discussion, Australia is really symptomatic of, oh, sorry, also help if can move the slides on. Um, Australia is really symptomatic of the many issues in restricted access data. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with Australia, there are three tiers of government uh, comprising hundreds of local government areas. There's eight state and territory governments, as well as a national government. In addition, there are 43 universities, over 20 major collecting institutions, around nine major non-government groups managing land for conservation purposes, 50 land management agencies, Indigenous ranger groups, and thousands of companies undertaking environmental consulting or land management. Most agencies have restricted access uh, policies of some description, and eight of the nine jurisdictions and at least four NGOs maintain their own lists of sensitive species. Then there are international organisations like GBIF, BOLD and GenBank to consider. Um, to take a single species, just to really emphasise what the issue is. So this is the grey falcon. Um, the species is threatened in every jurisdiction in Australia, except for Tasmania, because it doesn't occur there. Um, it appears on the sensitive species list for New South Wales, Queensland, Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia. And it is also on the sensitive list of BirdLife Australia. Uh, so here's what we all do. And this is the reason why we need a standardised approach, pro, approach to this. So New, New South Wales generalises occurrences to one kilometre. Queensland generalises queries down to two kilometres. Northern Territory generalises to 10 kilometres, as does South Australia. Western Australia withholds records entirely, and currently bird life with, withholds breeding records. However, none of the museums or CSIRO collections withhold records, and records are also available in GBIF and GenBank, uh, and eBird doesn't recognise the species as sensitive. So you've got this ridiculous situation where effectively... In the case of grey falcons, which are fairly nomadic, you're not likely to be able to find one. But for a lot of species, you can actually nail exactly where the bloody thing occurs because some data sets are uh, uh, restricted and some aren't. And so just to emphasise that, <laughs> the result is... A, is, is looks like a really convincing uh, distribution map. And it's impossible to see at first glance that uh, records are actually missing from WA. So there's no state 
uh, data set records there for WA at all. Uh, what you're seeing is a mishmash of records from other providers which overlap Western Australia and make it look like there's a convincing distribution in Western Australia. Um, the, the distributions look entirely sensible for the rest of the country. Uh, and this is why in Australia we went, we tried to start developing a national framework. Um, so the result is a convincing, oh, sorry, um, the, the, the national framework which was developed earlier this year, the national principles are aiming to be consistent with government requirements and fair and care principles. Uh, we're aiming for a consistent classification uh, of what people are calling restricted access data. Now, the reason we went for restricted access rather than sensitive is that what we discovered in the process of doing the project was that most organisations conflated sensitive with government sensitivity. And, and so what they were doing was just reflexively which withholding records because there was this mindset that what they were actually dealing, they, they had some legislative basis for their decision making. So by calling the data restricted data, we're trying to disentangle the issues of data that is in some way black data because of perfectly valid or well, possibly perfectly valid government restrictions from data that is actually withheld for policy, perfectly, equally perfectly valid legal or policy or conservation issues. Um, so the national principles are, are really about handling of restricted access species data uh, consistent with uh, government requirements and fair and care principles. Restricted access species data should be consistently identified and classified. Restricted access data should be discoverable. So there's a big focus in the framework on if you're going to withhold data, you publish a metadata so you can actually tell that there is data available in this species and who you need to talk to to get it. Um, the uh, restricted access data, uh, if people are making queries, data should be provided uh, in response to an approved request uh, in a completed possible, is in as complete a form as possible. Restricted access data, lastly, should be transformed consistently if it's made public. So rather than kind of getting that hodgepodge map where you've got a whole bunch of different treatments, you have ideally, if not one treatment across the, 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 the nation, you have a publicly available document that actually says, here's how all the data sets are being restricted so that people understand what they can or can't do with their data. And sorry, I'm probably running slightly over time because I'm gabbling. Um, so in terms of what we're talking about with restricted access data, in Australia, as part of the framework, we, we kind of broke it down into some uh, high-level principles. So the first one is personal identifiable information. The reason that's included is in Australia, personal identifiable information is protected by legislation nationally in most states and territories except for Western Australia. Um, so there's a requirement to... And it's a frequently encountered reason for withholding data that because it's got people's personal names in it, you have to withhold the entire data set with what you actually need to do is withhold the fields that contain that data. Um, indigenous data, for the, for the framework as it currently stands, we've encouraged the application of care principles, but what we've done is recognise that there's a category of culturally important sensitive data that will need to be considered there in future after a long uh, consultation process with communities. Um, the third category are usage restricted categories. So that generally means categories where the, a, a data aggregator holds a data set that belongs to someone else. There's a legal agreement in place for access to that data and they can't pass it on to a third party. Um, the fourth category is species related categories. And so they're generally location restricted data. So uh, a data set contains species where access to information about the exact location causes sensitivity. So that's your classic uh, orchids uh, at risk of being collected. Um, but it also includes um, uh, uh, 
things such as uh, it, it might include items in the habitat. So, for example, nest trees uh, that might be present in forestry operations or the like. Um, the the other component is identification data. So a data set that contains species whose identification has major ramifications. So the classic example of biosecurity species that aren't found in a country. If you get an incursion, uh, the record can actually threaten multi-million dollar export markets. And, and so the record needs to actually be obfuscated so it doesn't impact uh, on economics. Uh, the, the other... A rather more curious reason. Oh, sorry. The, the, then the last category is attribute data. Where so we're a data set which contains additional information that or information that causes additional sensitivity. So that would be things like uh, uh, location of pest control activities. So quite often uh, we want access to information about what's happening with uh, feral animals, but. Uh, the landholder won't actually supply the data unless it's withheld because they're concerned that their neighbours are going to shoot them if they know they've got feral dogs on their property. Or uh, the other interesting one was defence. Defence are perfectly happy to share their data, and they've got copious amounts of it, uh, on to with government or with researchers. What they won't do is put it in the public arena because they're worried about people um, getting blown up by howitzers uh, if they go and uh, illegally access their land to look for broad-headed snakes. Now, I'm just going to skip over the next... Oh, no, I will... So I'm just going to wrap up here so that uh, I can pass on to Andrew. So the other component that what we're talking about this evening is, is the concept of, of uh, sensitive species list or restricted access species lists. So in Australia, there are about 7,500 7 species that are identified as sensitive by one or other jurisdiction or organisation. Um, of those, only 162 occur in more than one jurisdiction. Um, so... Uh, what we need is a what we need in Australia, and what we're working to into to in Australia is a, is a full list of all those seven thousand four hundred and thirty five species, so that uh, all organisations wishing to apply restricted access obfuscation or generalisation are applying it consistently to the right species in the right jurisdiction, where we ultimately hope to get to someday in the future is a single list with a single list of species. I might add the reason why there's seven and a half thousand uh, is purely because some jurisdictions include everything that is uh, identified as a threatened species as sensitive. Other jurisdictions take a much more shrink wrap approach and they have a, a, a very well-developed policy for and uh, expert panel for looking at things that need to become sensitive um, and making them sensitive, but they may be threatened and they may not be threatened. There's there's a bit of variation. And I will leave it there and hand over to Andrew, who's just going to give a perspective on the international arena. Andrew, I'm hoping you're there. Andrew, can you hear us? Sorry. Okay, I think. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Andrew. Hi, um, sorry, one second. I'm just trying to sort out all the, um, the share my screen. So you might want to play the video that I sent. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm not sure I can share my screen from inside the um, the platform here. It's all right. We've we've got your uh, presentation here. Brilliant. It'll uh, be up shortly. Thanks. Um, and great to see so many of you there. So good morning here from Copenhagen.
No, that's not good. Oop, we're back. <laughs> can you see a presentation now, Andrew? Yeah, I can see a presentation, yeah. Okay, so you just have to give a yodel when you want to change slides. Ah, okay, yeah, so you want to talk through it. Okay, great. Okay, well, um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see so many of you there. Um, my colleague, Demetrius, said that there's a good number in the room. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is some of the work that we sort of kicked off last year around what we were calling sensitive species at the time. And this really came from a um, sort of question that I would often be asked when I was going around, which was um, people had a feeling that we were making publicly available potentially sensitive data, so data that would increase threat to individuals of a, um, of a certain taxa. Um, so next slide. Um, so last year we put out an open call uh, and we commissioned a report that we worked with Dr. Francisca Storga of the University of Mayor in Chile. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to get an overview of existing sensitive species frameworks. So these would be at a national or an organizational level and looking to see to what extent they were applying Chapman's guidelines. We wanted to look at the utility of a global uh, checklist or trigger list that we could use potentially for um, identifying sensitivity within the data. And we used the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species and CITES Appendices lists. Um, we also wanted to get a feel to uh, what degree uh, data publishers were generalizing would be sensitive or potentially sensitive data. Um, so from all the data coming in into GBIF. So we've just finalizing that report now and we aim to get the recommendations out at the end of October for um, public consultation. So if we, next slide. Um, so we identified nine uh, national or organizational systems. So these were frameworks for identifying sensitive data at a national or organizational level. We've got Australia, New Zealand, France, Sweden, United Kingdom, South Africa, Finland, Switzerland, eBird and iNaturalist. So these all have frameworks for identifying sensitive species and then associated generalized uh, associated protocols for generalizing data um, after them. As Cam showed, it's, it can be complex even at a national level. Um, and um, all of these were different models, um, often involving national stakeholder processes and consultation processes. Um, and um, a number of them also had user feedback mechanisms as well, so to allow users of the system to um, flag potentially sensitive species um, data. So we looked at the different frameworks that were in place and we compared them to um, Chapman's framework. So in Chapman's framework, there was sort of three main elements of identifying potentially sensitive taxa. First of all, identifying whether there is a risk to that specific taxon, um, then assessing the impact that that, um, uh, that risk will have on, on the taxon. And then asking the question of whether uh, releasing the data on that taxon would actually um, uh, mean more harm would come to that, um, to, to that uh, species. So we sort of looked at the, the different frameworks and we compared them to these three areas. And what we found is that the majority of these um, systems were using the risk of harm, um, often um, in a listing on an IUCN red list or a national red list to identify a potentially sensitive tax. And the other two, impact of harm and sensitivity of data, we used um, less frequently. Next slide. Um, we then looked at global trigger lists. So we looked at the IUCN Red List and the CITES appendices to see um, whether these might give us some, um, th th some, there might be some utility in using these uh, for identifying sensitive species lists at a global level. And this is particularly relevant given that we only found nine across the entire world of um, uh, national or organizational systems that were, that, that were in place. Um, so what we did here is we chose a, um, a smaller subset of the IUCN uh, Global Red List. So we specifically focused in on those species where we thought we could identify, uh, well, a sp smaller subset of species that were uh, where a threat identified was um, the specific targeted exploitation of that species. So where we might 
automatically assume that these species are more sensitive to the public release of data. So we used the biological resource use filter of the IUCN Red List to identify 12,890 potentially sensitive species. And 41% um, of those were um, threatened. Um, the rest were at least concerned, data deficient or uh, near threatened. We then identified um, 40, well, nearly 41,000 taxa under the three CITES appendices. So um, these were our sort of global trigger list species that we would um, um, interrogate the GBIF with. So next slide. So we wanted to check to see to what extent these global trigger lists overlapped with national and organizational lists to see um, whether there was any kind of, if we were seeing the same tax are appearing on, on those lists. So we compiled the, uh, the species on the national and organizational lists, and we got 9,233 sensitive taxa, of which a great many were from Australia, you've seen that, um, uh, from Cam, there were quite a large number of taxa there. What we found is that from these, this compiled list of taxa at a national and a uh, organizational level, that the majority, 5,715, had not been evaluated by IUCN. So uh, they wouldn't have been picked up if we were using the um, IUCN uh, global red list. Um, and only 220 were found on the IUCN sensitive list. So from that 9,233, only 220 species were um, found on the um, smaller subset from the IUCN global red list. We also found significant biases in the taxonomy, or at least uh, the, the taxonomy on the national and um, organizational list, found a much higher representation of plant taxa um, as when we compared to the global red list. So, um, and so that reflects um, most likely um, a, um, the taxonomic biases within these global red lists. So uh, in general, uh, non-vertebrate um, species are um, less well assessed um, on these global red lists. What we did find was with the CITES list, we found there was a little more signal there. So from the, um, we found 1,200 species on this, from this 9,200 list on the national sensitive list were found on the CITES lists. So we were finding more CITES listed species on these national lists than we were the um, red list species. Um, as I said earlier, it's important to remember that we only had a uh, we could only find nine national frameworks in place and that these were not necessarily representative of global biodiversity. So with big gaps in, um, in Africa, South America, Asia, um, where we had no lists whatsoever and um, where um, uh, the global red list would have more information on those taxa. Next slide. Um, so we also wanted to look at how data was being managed within GBIF. Um, so we wanted to see to what extent um, data from sensitive or potentially sensitive species were being generalized, what extent they were using recommended Darwin core terms as uh, recommended by um, Chapman, um, and uh, to what extent protocols were being applied across geographies and different organizations. So next slide. So uh, for the generalizations, what we did is we took a um, subset. So we got 38 million records for 5,728 species. And these were for taxa found on either the national, the compiled national or um, uh, organizational lists or the smaller subset of the IUCN red list that were threatened from biological resource use. And we took only the threatened uh, species and the near threatened. So we got 5,728 species from um, putting those two lists together and we got 38 million records. So these were we would consider um, sensitive or uh, potentially sensitive species. They were both threatened and either listed nationally or were um, threatened by biological resource use. We then wanted to identify which species may have been um, generalized. And what we look at, looked at were um, five generalization fields, um, DG, uh, data generalization, information withheld, coordinate uncertainty, coordinate precision, and footprint WKT used as three fields for indicating where there may have been some generalization of the locality data. 
what we found is for this subset of species that we uh, considered sensitive or um, uh, potentially sensitive, only 362 of these species had all of their records um, generalized using, um, identified using the um, information withheld or the data generalization. And these species had generally a, a very small number of records that were associated to them. Uh, we found that most records were not generalized at all for these um, sensitive or potentially sensitive species, so 40 to 58 percent of those. And that was even when we were taking coordinate uncertainty into account, which was we consider more a measure of the uncertainty around um, a measurement. Um, we also looked at to what degree repatriated data, so data that was being published on sensitive species identified at a national level, uh, to what extent data for those species by publishers outside of the country um, where they were listed as sensitive were, were generalized in their data. And interestingly, we found that those data tended to be um, uh, better generalized than data at a, at a national level, which was a, a something interesting and what we weren't expecting to find. Next slide. Um, so then we also looked specifically at the information withheld and the data generalization terms, which are the two fields that are recommended uh, within Chapman for, for providing information on sensitivity. Um, so we took a smaller subset of the, of the data. So we took um, just over 270,000 occurrences that we're using the information withheld and the data generalization um, uh, terms. And we uh, looked to see to, to how they were being used across these, these, these data. So we had um, 187,000 that were using information withheld, um, and we found that only 3.3% referred to any sensitivity within the data, um, and a lot of other information was provided within that field. We had 107,000 occurrences that were using um, the data generalization field, and 75% were, were, were using, um, uh, were referring to sensitivity within the data. So um, there was the terms are being used inconsistently um, across um, the different taxa and there was um, and the sensitivity um, was perhaps um, not very well flagged within the, the data that was being provided. So next slide. Um, and then finally, we looked at two specific examples. So these are sort of well-known um, what we called sensitive taxa. So we looked at the rhinoceroses and orchids. Um, what we found were for the five extant species of rhinoceros um, that nearly, well, 80, just over 89% of the um, occurrences were being generalized and, were, and the information was provided with the information withheld and data generalization terms with information withheld being used most frequently, um, and then to protect the threatened taxon was the, the, the free text that was most often provided. We still found 10% of records for rhinoceroses were being provided with generalizations under 250 meters. So there was still um, a significant number that were, um, may not be considered um, generalized um, sufficiently to protect that taxon. We also had orchids, um, so we looked at the only the threatened orchids. Um, uh, for here, that we had sixteen thousand six hundred and forty-seven occurrences. Um, we found that twenty-two percent of those occurrences were using the information withheld term, and another fifty-two percent were using the term uh, the the data generalization. And what we saw there was a uh, different free text, often referring to national frameworks um, and um, and and the reason why the court uh, the the, um, the data was generalized. Um, for the threatened orchids, we found that 32% of occurrences um, were being provided with no generalization um, whatsoever. Um, next slide. Um, so the key points uh, to take away, from, I, I guess, from the from the review is that there are a, a number of national approaches out there. So I think there's uh, some maturity now in developing these national frameworks. Um, uh, and that we should be supporting these and building uh, building on these. Um, that global lists can provide some signal, um, but really it was these local national lists that were really providing the the, the best information. They were really providing um, it's through these those lists that you get a better understanding of the local context of what species, what sort of threatening activities are going on at um, uh, at a national level. 
Um, also found that data on sensitive, uh, potentially sensitive species are inconsistently generalized and Darwin core terms uh, uh, are not being used consistently across different taxa and uh, across different publishers. Um, so next slide, and just to thank you all for listening and um, yeah, looking forward to the rest of the workshop. Thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew. And uh, now it's peas. Nope, nope. Other one. That's it. That's the one. Um, so I'm going to just do a quick five minutes just on a possible solution to some of this stuff. Um, as you can tell from what Cam's talked about and from what Andrew's talked about, this is a really complex beast to play with. So we put in a, come on, there we go. Um, we put in a, a, there's an abstract you can read, which talks a little bit more about this, but really it's the, the three little balls at the bottom. We've talked about the RASD context. Uh, from Cam, we've talked about the international context from Andrew. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is a solution to part of the problem that has already been implemented, and that's the um, the RASD uh, service that's now up and running for the Atlas of Living uh, via the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, there's a link at the bottom, and effectively, this um, is talking really about when we talk about the fair um, principles. This is the F. This is findable. So we're starting to look at um, solving at least one part of the, prop the complex problem that's out there uh, through this approach. And this is a system that um, my team at Gaia has built on behalf of the, the ALA. So the actual RASD service um, is well described on the actual site. What does it do and who's it for? Um, it's all about a single place for users to discover and request. So it's also starting to deal with the accessibility and sort of enabling people to have access to, to data as well. Um, and it's really focusing on those those two types of people. It's the data requesters, people who are seeking data, and the data custodians, people who hold that data to make it findable and accessible. Um, it actually doesn't hold data at this time. It's a request facilitation service. So just being really clear about that up front, at this start point in time, it's not actually passing data around and dealing with that. It's simply helping manage the request and to make that data findable. The quick view of it um, then is, you know, you can actually go to it. Uh, you can start filtering by things that you're interested in. So this will be a, a fairly standard ALA type, you know, interface that you'd be used to. Um, you can go through and search for particular keywords, location, descriptions, all those sorts of approaches. Um, put in filters and see data sets that are, that are there and listed um, that have restricted access species data within them that have been nominated by the by the data custodians. Um, you can then go through a form. Um, it's a bit of a complex piece to go through the form, but it actually gets you through all those little bullet points on the left. What's the purpose of it? You know, what topic? What's the benefit statement? What data you're after? So it's it's here you're actually starting to fill out that information about why you want the data and what, what you want to use it for. And that gives the actual data custodians the opportunity to actually sort of really evaluate what it is that you're asking. Um, it's a bit of a change from the days when I used to just bring people up and say, hey, I need some data. Um, now you've actually got to, you know, write it all down and get it all sorted. Um, and then also, you know, one of the things that I, I particularly think is good is, is if your data is not approved as a full resolution delivery, there's a little box down the bottom that I've got just down the bottom that says, well, would you be happy with something that was denatured, you know, just in case. So if, you know, for whatever reason you weren't provided access, you could actually get something that was uh, less, uh, less, detailed. Um, it basically works through two, two main pathways. So if you're a data custodian, if you've got your uh, range of data sets that have restricted access species data and you want to make it available for people and to use the service, then you can basically register as a data custodian, lodge the data sets that uh, you want to be using and, and making available to people, and then people can actually search, find them and request it, and those requests will come to you for approval. Um, you can also be a data requester where you can just go in and say, well, I want to actually go and search and, and request data sets 
Um, so you actually need to have that logged in approach to actually be able to um, you know, request access to the data as well. The main way that it works is through two sets of tools. If you're a data custodian, you're either managing the data sets that you put in there or you're managing requests that come through you. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, if you're a data requester, you can see the status of the request that you're at um, and then you can go into the searching mechanisms and play around with that. So it's, it's fairly simple. Um, but you end up with these sorts of tools that are quite complex that say, well, these are all the requests that you've got coming. This is what the status of them are in. You can go and view them, have a look at all through the details and go through that, or you can be searching and filtering and doing that on the requester side. So quite a, quite a neat little interface, I think, in that sense. At any stage, you can actually see where you're at. And that's the, that's the big thing I quite like about this system in particular is that you can actually see who has been requesting data sets from you, um, what's the status of that data set. You can see the purpose of it. You can go and view the form if you're a data custodian. And if you're a data requester, you can see what the status of your data set is at and your request is at as well. So you can go and see, oh, it's still sitting with them. They're pending looking at it. And you're like, okay, that's cool. I know where it's at. So it's very transparent. Again, it's about that findable, accessible, trying to be open using those principles. Um, so I, I, don't, I repeated this slide twice and then got told off by a whole bunch of people for repeating it, but it's actually really key for, for making sure that you understand there's not data in it at this point in time. It is a request management service. So it's only dealing with the first part of the, the solution, but it is up and running and it is live via that URL. So if you want to go and have a play with it, then I suggest you do. But that whole um, little quick service uh, review of it is just to sort of get you thinking about the frameworks we're about to talk about and what you could do with it and how would you actually implement it and operationalize it. So um, I think we go back to you for the next bit. So thanks very much. Um, so the, the way we're going to structure this, firstly, is to give everybody an opportunity to ask any questions you might have had about those presentations. But these were really meant to be just context and scene setting for the, the subsequent discussion. So what we're intending to do is basically break the rest of the workshop up into uh, uh, two sessions. The first session will kind of look at uh, uh, the Chapman suggestions or recommendations to Tadwig in terms of uh, fields to be added to Darwin Core. Um, and we're hoping to use those as the basis for a discussion about that element. And then a second session uh, to talk about uh, generalisation practices, national species lists, or sorry, restricted access species lists and the like. So firstly, are there any questions for any of the presenters? Bob. Oh, um, do we have a microphone? Not really loud. Well, the, yeah, but the people online won't hear you. Thank you. The, the question is really to Cam, Arthur, um, Andrew, whoever wants to answer it. Cave fauna, they're a special case because the locations of caves are often in the hands of data custodians who are non governmental. They're cave groups, spelunkers, speleologists, and so on. Yep. And finding or managing data of, for cave fauna has these two levels, if you like, of complexity in restricting access data. Um, is the Australian procedure uh, going to involve cave groups, caving groups? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, oh, I'll, uh, so, Bob, um, so my, fir my first comment would be, I can actually, so one of the things that I did when I started this project was actually look at cave fauna because I went, okay, how easy would it be uh, for me to, because I know particularly the the um, the Steiger fauna you get in some of the, the Nullarbor caves. So it took me exactly four minutes to find 32 caves on the Nullarbor plain using the ALA. Um, and... All of the Steiger fauna records were uh, either withheld or obfuscated. Uh, however, um, Gavin Prido in his infinite wisdom had loaded a whole bunch of uh, 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 type specimens for um, uh, uh, 
Pleistocene subfossils into the ALA and they very nicely mapped all of the caves across the Nullarbor. So this is a really good example of the kind of stuff that we've just got to get a better handle on. But, yes, um, the the intent is to, to cover off on these issues. Uh, it's it's coming up. The, the, the framework is a framework. It, it provides a mechanism for doing it. But progressively over the next couple of years, we need to go out to each interest group and try to deal with specifics uh, within that interest group. Arthur, did you want to add anything more? No, I've got a question following that. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Hi, uh, Chuck Cook, Global Biodata Coalition. So there's, uh, I have two, two questions which aren't particularly related. Um, there's a parallel use case here for restricted access um, patient data, well, research data associated with humans. Yep. Like the European Genome Phenome Archive. I, I just assume you're familiar with that and have looked at how that works. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, the, but that, that, that works slightly differently, and at least the EGA does, and the, the, uh, the, the similar one in the US, which his name I've forgotten, in that they actually hold the data. So, they, so in this case, if you're not holding the data, there are multiple data providers and they have to negotiate with the user separately. So is there any sort of systematic way of doing that or are they all doing their own thing? Um, so good question. So in Australia, the, the, so we, we actually took our model uh, based on uh, uh, FinBIF, the, um, the Finnish Biodiversity uh, Information Facility, which just have the best system for managing sensitive species data I've come across yet. Um, so... But but the, the basic challenges that they were trying to overcome was the the idea that data custodians still wanted to maintain control over their data, which was very similar to Australia. Um, and uh, uh, the um, and when we went out to try to to develop the restricted access species data framework, uh, the the other component, which was the data service that Piers was talking about. We immediately struck problems the moment there was any kind of discussion of aggregation of data because no one was prepared to allow data to be given to an aggregator and then dispersed to third parties without retaining some control over management. So the the alternate way of dealing with that was to follow the, the awesome FinBiff example uh, and come up with a data service where people could uh, use a centralised point to request the data. The data goes out to all of the individual data custodians. The data custodians have all agreed to assess those requests according to the national framework. And so, and the system itself, thanks to Piers' team, actually track progress. So you can make sure that each request gets delivered more or less on time. So even though it's relatively complicated what it does enable is that most data custodians have data sovereignty over their their data sets i've got two issues that haven't been mentioned so far one is associated data um, i'll give an example of of how this really came to my mind just in the last week i was loading up some uh, data of a very sensitive species in queensland um, and I generalised the location, etc. But then realised you could go into this is on iNaturalist. You could go into iNaturalist and look at all the other collects photographs I'd made at the same time. So I then had to go back in and generalise the time as well on the yep. thing. Otherwise, somebody could say, "Oh, he's right there," and there's <laughs> three other specimens. He's photographed at the same time. So that's a, a, associated data is also very important, looking at collector, collector number. And it's, a, it, it's actually a really good point you make, Arthur, and it's a shame that the, the Danju team from Western Australia, have, I think, have now left the room. Um, they, uh, they actually did. Have you heard about their hackathon? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, so Western Australia actually ran a hackathon where they, uh, they, um, uh, got a, a bunch of records that may or may not have been sensitive, uh, gave it to, and, and basically got a, a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, computer people to try to figure out where the records were. 
and they got about a 90% uh, correlated success rate because effectively all they had to do was they, they just very quickly figured out that uh, most of the data the the the, the uh, associated data of common species could be found online and they they reverse engineered it so yeah very valid point the second point is on the opposite way uh, we talked about um, using the I, IUCN lists and the CITES lists CITES not so big a problem, but the IUCN list, but there are a number of species that are uh, very sensitive, say, for example, in Australia, but they're a big weed in Florida or South, uh, South Africa. So you don't want all the information in South Africa restricted, all those, because those people that are trying to control it won't know where it is. So it's not only a taxon issue, it's a taxon uh, and location issue. Yes. That you want to restrict it in a certain place, but not everywhere that that species may occur. Um, Arthur, while you've got the, the microphone, um, uh, and I'm going to kind of make this a slightly more generalised session than I'd intended to, but would you um, mind taking people through the, the randomisation versus generalisation issues in terms of uh, um, consistency of... of, of uh, generalise or obfuscation? Um, I think the best way to look at it is uh, in images with um, uh, there's lossless image compression and there's lossy image compression, JPEG, etc. One, you can get back the original data if you have to and the other you can't. It's, and with randomisation, um, you... You're putting it anywhere, so it can be put right in the middle of the town and there's no way you can accurately tell people that this has been generalised within this particular area, so uh, randomised. But by generalisation, you're taking it, reducing the number of um, the precision of the location down to either three decimal points, two decimal points, one decimal point, etc. So you're saying it's in that grid. So you're just putting it in that point there and you're saying it's within that grid. So you know within a particular area that it is and depending on the sensitivity or the... Uh, you can change the size of that grid. So if it's really sensitive, you might only say to a degree or to a tenth of a degree if it's less sensitive, etc., And that might also involve whether you can um, find the habitat that's within that particular area. So generalisation, it's, it's really... Uh, Randomisation is a lossy way of, of storing the data, whereas um, generalisation is a lossless way. You're still using the location, but you're using it grid-based. System. Thanks, Arthur. Um, any other questions or, or comments on, on the topic? Yeah, sorry, can't. Um, I'm assuming Andrew can't actually speak at the moment. Can? Can you hear? Oh, Andrew, I think you're being given to the opportunity to talk. Oh, thanks, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on Arthur's comment there around the, um, not just a question about taxon, but also a question of location. I think that that's definitely one of the things that we saw coming out of the report. So I think originally, initially we went in when we commissioned the report thinking that there could be a way of genera generating this, um, this global list that you could somehow use to flag sensitive species um, in different jur jurisdictions around the world, and then you could just apply these generalization protocols um, across taxa. Uh, what we really found, though, is that the, 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 where, you, the, where you have real signal is when you have these local lists, sensitive species lists, um, because that's really reflecting where you would get differences what, to the one you said, for instance, where it's invasive in one country, but then highly sensitive in, in another. And that actually using these global lists is uh, not necessarily the best way of doing it. And, and there are some organizations that will do that. So a good example would be iNaturalist, for instance, which will take, which will apply generalization protocols across all of it, 
any threatened species on, on the, the IUCN global red list. But of course, by doing that, there's a risk that we're losing um, what is essentially really good data. That data is not necessarily sensitive. Um, and so we just have to be careful when we're using these um, these global trigger lists. Um, so yeah, that was the only thing I just wanted to add to, to Arthur's point. Thanks, Andrew. Um, while we've got you, uh, can you actually see if there's any uh, uh, any of our uh, online participants have any questions? Um, I can't see any. Let's just uh, one second. No, no questions on, on uh, online. Okay, thanks. And are there any other comments or, or questions in the room? Otherwise, we might uh, roll on to some outcomes. <laughs> so, um, just let me grab my... Now, on the basis that everybody... Oh, sorry. On the basis that everybody hasn't actually read the uh, pre-reading. Um, and because I'm an incompetent session chairperson, it didn't occur to me to actually put this up on on the screen. But anyway, um, just bear with me a moment. Can I suggest that you put the links into the Slack channel? Uh, we'll get to everybody in the next month or so. Yep. Uh, I'll do that, but I won't do it now because I'm not currently hooked in at all, which uh, is not good. Anyway, so look, uh, yeah, I'll... Uh, sorry? There's a handouts button on the side of the screen somewhere there. For the subset of people that actually have their... Uh... But then I think you can put it there. Oh, no, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Is it possible to open that tenure or...? Awesome. Yep. Um, could you go down to the first attachment, please? So while I'm completely incompetent, tenure isn't, which is... Um, okay, so um, one of the things we're particularly keen to do is kind of, as, as I said at the start, is, is push forward on um, Arthur's recommendations on uh, e extension to Darwin Core for sensitive taxa. So what Arthur's basically done is, is proposed a, a, a series of uh, fields and, and uh, comments. And... Um, Tanya, if you wouldn't mind just scrolling slightly higher up so we can get them all on the screen at the same time. Oop, nope, down. Oop, bit too far down. <laughs> um, so I personally don't think there's there's anything even vaguely uh, um, uh, uh, controversial about this, but they're, they're basically sensible uh, additions to Darwin Core. Uh, but I suppose reading through them, do, does does this kind of cause alarm in anybody's imagination, or or do do people have thoughts about it, or? Uh, additional comments on it, I suppose, would be my question. Well, that was a good way of killing all the conversation. Jeez. <laughs> well, you know, it, it always comes back to bite. <laughs> Small comment, but I appreciate that there's a pick list. Oop, hang on, wait for the uh, microphone. Um, this is a small comment, but I appreciate that there's a pick list for the data sensitive reason because we often deal with. Um, I, I work in telemetry, and there's often, oh, well, the reason is just because. Can you please make it private? And then 
you know, when it's a free form text field, that's what we get. Yep. So that's about it. Oh, come on. Oh. Um, in the document, those criteria one to four above and one A to four G attachments has wording there for each of those. Um, yeah. And you could put them into the pick list. I didn't put them into there because it just repeating what was already in the document. Yeah. I, I suppose there could be an issue of uh, a researcher just choosing a random one and then you kind of just have to take their word for it. Yep. Yeah. I, I suppose there could be an issue with uh, a researcher just choosing a random one from that list and then you kind of have to say, okay, we accept their reason, even if, you know, maybe it's not valid where the real reason is they just want to publish a paper on it, you know, but... Um, so, sorry, just for the benefit of everybody online who I've just discovered can't actually see the document that we've put up in the room, which is slightly uh, vexing. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to give a textural description. But so, so basically, the the attachment, uh, um, Tanya, the online people can presumably see the notes on the side, though. Okay, so uh, for people online, if you look at the right-hand side of um, your screen, there should be a, a button that enables you to, to download the um, attachment that has the agenda. We're currently looking at attachment one, um, which is uh, recommendations for metadata. Um, The recommendations basically cover off a series of Darwin core fields. The first one is data sensitive indicator, which is a yes, no flag that the observation is sensitive. The second field is Darwin sensitive reason, um, sorry, data sensitive reason. The primary reason why the, why the data is sensitive suggested format is either a pick list with values derived from criteria one to four above or a, a test field that combines statements Bloody bloody blah, 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 and that's the field that we're we're currently discussing the the ability to actually delineate why a data set is sensitive. Um, for those who, for some reason, might be having problems downloading, the other Darwin core fields that we're talking about is Darwin da, data sensitive comments, which is further free text information on the reason or supporting rationale for determining relevance of the criteria for this record. Uh, data sensitive for review, a data field documenting when the sensitive nature of the data should be reviewed, especially important where the sensitivity is just awaiting publication of results. Precision data provided, the scale or precision of the data made available via the Darwin core record may be done as coordinate pre precision such as uh, Oh, my glasses are too dirty to do this. Uh, zero to one degree, one to point zero point one degree, two to two equals. Sorry, zero equals point uh, one degree. Is that one degree? One degree. Sorry, scratch that again. Zero equals one degree. One equals zero point one degree. Two equals zero point zero one degree. Three equals zero point double zero one degree, and four equals zero point zero 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 one degree. And lastly, uh, precision of data stored, which is the scale or precision of the data stored or retained by the data custodian, which again may be done as a coordinate precision precision along the same lines. Um, do we still have Andrew? talkable or you should be able to hear me hello hello can you hear me i think you should be able to hear me now no yep we can just double checking again if there was any comments from you or from anyone else online. Um, no, 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 no. All it seems um, really sensible, especially yeah. I think that pick list is really helpful, actually, especially given the sort of range of information that was provided in the fields that we looked at. Um, I, I think having that pick list is uh, really helpful. Um, I had one thought though, so I think just. Um, and this, I would want to sort of go to you, Cam, actually, for your for your guidance on this. Do you think that this 
Um, so one of the aspects of this workshop was talking about indigenous knowledge. Um, do you see this fitting, working well for, for that sort of information as well? Uh, not in its current form um, would be my suggestion, but uh, I, I think this is a reasonable first start. Um, I, like, I just don't think the consultation has been done with communities in Australia okay. to be able to answer that comprehensively. But I think the the, the data sensitive reason uh, at least gives us a field for actually delineating that as a concern. Oh, we got hang on two comments. I think the the fields there may work with the Aboriginal. You just need the data sensitive reason. You might have to add additional criteria. Yes, there. yeah, but that's the rest of it. Uh, I think would work fairly well. Yeah, I, I, I don't see a problem with it. Yeah, okay. Um. Alison Vaughan from Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria. I was just thinking about that too, Arthur, but for thinking about our Indigenous data that's sensitive, we wouldn't necessarily want to obfuscate it. Like there's no reason not to put the full lat longs there for a lot of it. What what we would be withholding is not the, the precision of the locality, it's actually the information about the medicinal use. or the. So I think, yeah, it's a great start. And I'd love to see it, but I think if you're going to go through the work of getting um, this up as an extension or an addition to Darwin Core, then, yeah, you, you'd probably want to just adjust it so you can say exactly what information is being withheld. Which, well, not what the information is, but what category of information is being withheld. Yeah, and I, I think that's... Um, Certainly, from the national framework perspective, it would it would require an additional ability to kind of indicate that a field has been withheld uh, for sensitive for sensitivity reasons. But I think that's a pretty simple addition to the the basic list of of items. But very valid point. Yeah, true. Any other comments or thoughts? On the basis, oh, yeah, I was talking with Andrew Turley at lunch, and he mentioned, you know, we, we have a group of landholders in the indigenous sense, but all those same principles could apply to the other landholders, as in the farmers, as yep. in as in industrial or mining sort of landholders. So these things should still apply. Now, yes, indigenous is just one example of a landholder. Is yep, is that right? Yeah, I I think. In in the course of doing the Australian framework, well, the the basic approach that we took was we we had a basic ability to withhold a field or obfuscate a point for cultural reasons. It was just that the that we recognised that the framework hadn't undergone um, broader Indigenous consultation, and we did we did speak with a few uh, Indigenous groups, and um, uh, they they felt data sovereignty was a really important issue that, that could be included in in the reasons for culturally withholding uh, data sets and the framework didn't at attend, attempt to address that what what we did was sort of say before you try to use data that overlaps uh, ne land you should be talking to communities um, Changing uh, subject slightly from indigenous to the importance of checklist. All the stories in this in this session have one one common line. There is a dependency on external checklist to tell you what's what. Yep. Uh, obviously, this community has a lot of tools already now to handle sensitive data in different ways. The Arthur's Guide, the study where 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 Andrew is involved, Australian experience, Finnish experience mentioned uh, handling known checklist with statuses seems to be quite advanced now compared to many thousand weeks ago. Yep. But, but um, people generating checklist data in general in biodiversity data community often are seen as like third class category. Sampling event is number one. Everybody wants abundance, quantitative data, point occurrences, also fine. We have collections, we have opportunistic data, citizen science, great. And there are also checklists. They're always third 
And nothing, no sensitive data handling can be done without efficient and trusted checklists. Yep. So I think there should be a way to package and send the signals from the discussions like this back to the uh, IUCN, back to yep. CITES, back to Greece, and all, all, all the all the communities which are often neglected, underfunded, and seen as a third class community. And they're absolutely not because of the topics discussed here. But I don't actually know how to do that. I, I think it's just important to remember that. Well, I think we, we'd argue that, that one of the, the core outcomes of this, this workshop would be, if we're all agreed, uh, is to first firstly progress these and make a recommendation to Tadwig that they do actually get considered as an extension. But then the second element would actually be uh, to, to start the process of, of, of trying to develop a, a, a global checklist or the basis of a global checklist and actually uh, go to IUCN, um, talk to the groups involved with CBD and actually start the process of, of, of getting an international approach on this. Um, I mean, apart from anything else, I think it's good to, for Tadwig to be seen to be actually interacting, interacting with global authorities in a way that's actually positive and having a, a, a great outcome for conservation. Is there anyone that finds that concerning, just to keep the conversation going? Well, in that case, I'll propose... Oh! Sorry. <laughs> This is not a um, you know contentious sort of thing, but the field that um, is sensitive date for review, that's the only field that I think is difficult to know how to populate. Everything else is fairly clear. You know, it works through the guidelines. is you know, easy, easy to work with. But that one, I was just like, is there any kind of guidelines as to know what kind of period you should be setting for different types of things? Good question. That one particularly came up years ago under the GBIF umbrella. We ran a series of workshops around the world and a lot of people didn't want to release their data until they got the information published. And that was a lot of the background for that was one that um, you don't want to say put something on a list uh, waiting for publication and never get taken off. So we put that in there so that uh, it would give an idea that, okay, every 12 months or every six months or something, it should be reviewed for that species or that taxon or that observation so that you could remove the sensitivity off that. Um, there may be other reasons, I don't know, for uh, why you might want to remove a an observation when you, after more research you found that it's not as rare as you thought it was or it's not a subject to human harm as you thought it was so you could then remove it off the case and i believe that everything should be reviewed periodically whether it's every 12 months or every five years or something to just make sure that yeah it's extinct we don't need to protect it anymore so the um, we've got a couple other comments, but the, the other thing I'd say is that the national framework actually, uh, um, we uh, we actually kind of defined a field that that sort of indicates uh, it, it gives some suggestions for data custodians as to what they should be asking if they're accepting a data set that has some kind of uh, constraint on uh, when it can be published. So that so that because. The, as, as Arthur said, one of the things we found when, when we went around Australia was there were a lot of data sets that people might have got 10 years ago for a PhD and the person doing the PhD didn't want the data published until after the PhD. Well, the PhD has been published years ago, but the data is still being treated as sensitive. So, so that, that kind of use by date is a really important thing when aggregators or, or data custodians are actually acquiring data, they have a, a, a use by date on the data set. And also, oh. it might I just had another example of that, which is fisheries data. So, um, for commercially um, sensitive 
uh, information around fishing locations. And yep. so even though the species may not itself be threatened, there will often be confidentially, uh, confidentiality clauses for like 5, 10, 15 years potentially before yep. we can release this information. Yeah, it's it's a, and that's that's the kind of use case we're hitting with um, uh, feral species too, where, where uh, the um, and it's it's really interesting thing. It even a generalised record when it comes to feral species is problematic because all you're doing is shunting someone's dingo onto the neighbour's property and they get shot instead of the person who's actually got the dingo on their property. Uh, so, sorry, I shouldn't call them dingoes these days. Um, so, but yeah, it's it's that it's it's recognising uh, what makes the record sensitive and therefore what's got to be withheld. Yeah, again, there's a parallel here with uh, some of the molecular data bases for situations where it's just waiting for publication, so the data can be submitted and embargoed until publication. But there's there there's usually a period, a one or two year maximum embargo. And if the authors don't reconnect with the data resource, it just gets released automatically. It's, this is just to save staff time so they don't keep chasing people um, in that situation. So that, that could be implemented too. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think with, with my work with tracking data and telemetry stuff as well, you find that um, there's the publication embargo, the need for a publication embargo, but I wonder if there's more um, whether we could get data providers to consider an early release of, a, you know, a, a, a sort of obfuscated um, set of data, because it's the entire data set that they don't want to that they don't want to release, but perhaps they'd like to release part of it. You know, have this metadata stuff in there about what they've done, but then you, you know a data set and a, like a metadata set is out there uh, with the uh, you know saying this species, this location um, you know is being worked on here and you can gradually fill fill out the data set later on. But I, want, I, I guess I'm just pointing out that um, I wonder if it's good to start talking, uh, it, it, setting up an expectation with researchers mm -hmm. that they can share early um, even if there's a sensitivity um, for due to publication embargo, they can share early but not share everything and then with a view to sharing everything once their embargo lifts. But I, I would have thought that that would be, you know, support them as researchers in, um, you know, exposing the research that they're doing without necessarily their uh, sensitive data. Yep. Thanks, Peggy. Um, I was just going to add to what Cam and Arthur were talking about before with that, the publication thing. One thing I think is we really, and I'm not clear on whether it's captured there, but you really would need for that assessment, you'd need to capture enough information so that assessment of whether or not it can be released can be done by without having to contact the researcher um, or that it's it's very clear what the publication is so it's findable again so that someone who hasn't had anything to do with the um, flagging at a sensitive in the first place can come along and assess it because closing that loop, getting researchers to, you know, close the loop or let you know where they're at is really, really difficult. Yeah, so right. making sure that that's enough. Another kind of question um, is about the role of these standards and whether they're only for that sort of aggregators or whether you want them to serve internal purposes too. Because one of the situations we have is um, specimens that are subject to legal cases. So, you know, we, we have to database them, yep. but there's information there that we can't release um, with some of it ever but some we can't release until that case has been through the courts. And so we want to flag that internally. That's not actually going to be withheld from public necessarily. They don't need to know that that information is being withheld, but it would be a flag that tells us perhaps not to publish the, deliver the record to ALA at all. Um, so it's sort of an internal flag. So whether or not standards should be, 
covering those internal uses or only the the public thing? And I'm not sure yep. about that. I, I know we used to, at AM, we used to have a, uh, the highest level flag we had was not for external uh, use. And if anything of that flag just didn't go to the ALA. And, and so I think the answer is, yes, it needs to cover it. No, it's probably not publicly available. But but I, I would actually argue that the metadata statement that you, if you had a metadata statement in the uh, the RASD data service, for example, what that metadata statement would say that there's a subset of data that's withheld for legal reasons, and it doesn't need to say more than that. But but you're still making the data at least at least publicly aware, if not necessarily publicly findable. Um, I'm just mindful of the fact that we've got about 10 minutes left. So I suppose, um, and, and I, I would like to kind of shift the conversation onto, onto the, um, the concept of a, 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 a restricted or sensitive species list. Um, and I'm going to hassle Andrew in a moment to uh, give his, his views on this. But before, we, just to close down the conversation on that, that this Darwin core, uh, extension. The the plan is to kind of write up the result of this discussion and and present it and present the 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 additions to Darwin Core to Tadwick uh, with a recommendation that they they be accepted. I'm just checking if anyone has any strong reservations to that. What I'd probably do is propose that we kind of take the conversation away, maybe adjust them slightly based on uh, the couple of suggested tweaks that we've had here. Arthur, you've got your hand in the air. You'd have to set up a task group, probably yep. under Dar the Darwin Core interest group, yep. um, to to further that along. But yep. you'd need, under the way Tadwick works, you'd have to set up a task group. Okay. Well, we'll set up a task group then. Because this is going to happen. It's, it's high <laughs> time it happens. <laughs> um, if, if everybody, if I if I don't see see any nays, that's our kind of stated objective coming out of this. Uh, is everyone kind of content with that? Um, Andrew, yeah, if okay. you're still there, but powered by innovation and NEC, <laughs> I'm pleased to see. Um, uh, sorry, that's what's coming up on our screen. Uh, um, I, I suppose, like, firstly, just checking that you're happy with that, and secondly. Um, in the, the time remaining, we wanted to kind of talk about a, a, uh, a, a global sensitive species list. Um, and I suppose to put words into your mouth, the discussion that we've had over the course of the, the, the last hour and a half or hour and 20 minutes has, has really been about the idea, as Arthur said, of a list that, that uh, takes into account both uh, species and geographic location. So. The list might be global, but a, a taxon might only be listed in uh, one or two states around the world. Is that how you um, Yeah, it? definitely. Um, I think um, it's very difficult to take a taxon and say that this taxon is sensitive across its entire distribution. Um, what you really need is something much more fine scale. So to be able to go and say that this species in this specific area is um, is sensitive for whatever reason that might be. Um, when we tried taking the global list, such as the IUCN red list, it, it just was not reflecting what people were saying at a local level. Um, and so what my biggest concern, if you took one of these, these, these global lists, is that you're going to over generalize data um, and make it less accessible for what you really want that data for, which is to, to, to conserve species, essentially. Um, so, um, so yes, you want something that um, is really driven by local level knowledge. Um, and I think that's where um, we have some work to do. Uh, you know, it, it became very clear through the process that the majority of the world does not have really um, well-developed frameworks for identifying sensitive species at, at a national level or uh, even at a regional level. Um, 
And so I think there's, there's, there's some work there. And I think that's where we could potentially see some, um, um, some interest in working with IUCN and developing, and through our nodes as well, in developing capacity um, for, for, for developing these lists. Um, there was an, also another point as well that I just wanted to point on the sensitive date uh, for review. So I, I think actually, and this is, um, I don't know if this is uh, within this, uh, this workshop, but working with the, the private sector, one of their real um, concerns is the release of data before, for instance, um, licensing permits have been, have been released. So I think having that there would actually encourage um, the flows of data from, from that specific sector, um, just because they will have specific dates that they want to release the data um, tied in with, uh, with commercial um, sensitivities. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so yes, back to the global list, yes. Um, I think we need something that uh, is really driven um, um, through local knowledge and through local processes as well, um, which currently is um, needs help uh, developing around the world. Um, is that, can you still hear me? I can see you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 But doing that is is quite a complex process. Uh, That's the. Yes. So, um, in in terms of an outcome, and, and noting we're not going to uh, agree to a list of species here, but I think what we're aiming to do is kind of take Arthur again Arthur's recommendation of establishing a working towards establishing an international list with a series of criteria. Uh, maybe the, the next logical step is is kind of having as a recommendation out of this workshop that that that's what we want to work towards. Uh, we need to establish a uh, a um, a global interest group to to progress that objective, uh, maybe in partnership with IUCN or something like that. Uh, yes. Um... Yeah, um, and I guess one of the things that also came out of the, the, the study, just taking the two examples, and I guess um, uh, what we saw was there tended to be a little more signal when we took CITES appendices lists, but it, it, it was very um, yep. um, clear, or it wasn't clear, it was surprising, for instance, that we still have um, ungeneralized data for rhinoceroses, for instance, which... Um, uh, that was a surprise to me, and orchids as well. Um, and I think if we took something like the CITES appendices list, for instance, there's quite a bit of signal there that would feed into national processes, potentially. Um, but I think that would be something that we'd want to explore. Yep. Um, we, we do have a couple of questions from... Yes. Um, Justin Billing, Environmental Biosecurity again. Maybe a naive question. Why do we want a global sensitive species list? For what purpose? Who's it for? And is it better to each country has its own? And if you need a country's sensitive list, you go to the country to get that list. I don't understand the purpose, I guess, of a, a worldwide list of sensitive species because they'll be different for different purposes. Each country will have a different reason for making a set of species sensitive. Yep. Good question. Um, I'm going to jump in before Arthur. The, the practical example of I can give is Australia. So uh, I looked at the, uh, the top 50-odd uh, species in Australia that are listed as sensitive in Australia, and I could find where every single one of them, including the night parrot, occurs by going to um, GenBank because uh, um, there's a whole bunch of Australian data that's available from Gen GenBank with latitudes and longitudes uh, that are currently not even publicly. I can find, I can tell you where the Wollamai Pine is. There's a Wollamai Pine record floating around internationally that actually tells you exactly where it is. That's why we need it because uh, the it's not enough to it's it's not enough to uh, like Australia can have a, a, a sensitive species list of the cows come home, uh, but if if we've got data that uh, we're not sharing that list internationally to assist uh, international uh, interlocutors make the same decisions that we're making, it's it's basically pointless. 
And as a botanist, I go out in the field, I collect a number of duplicates, I send one to Kew, I send one to New York Botanical Gardens, I send one to Melbourne, you know, one somewhere else. And even though the Australian herbarium data might be restricted, I can pull it off in New York Botanical Garden or, or Kew or whatever. So they need to know what's sensitive so they can restrict it as well. Yeah, and I also just want to add to that as well that um, um, so, uh, yes, national lists are, uh, for me, the best information possible. Um, the real worry is that the majority of countries around the world do not have these kind of national sensitive species lists. Um, so you, uh, right now, we could find nine that were publicly available, um, but there obviously there are hundreds of countries out there that don't have these lists and for which we have no information on what sensitive species are in those countries. Um, and I'm going to probably round out the discussion there because we've, we've hit time. Um, but uh, uh, what we'll do is is write up the, the results of that and, and maybe uh, circulate it uh, uh, via Slack or uh, um, is probably the best uh, um, option. I'd, I'd like to thank Tanya <laughs> and our magnificent AV team up the back there for uh, a, a sterling effort making everything work, uh, as, as well as my as well as Arthur who got inveigled into helping out and is is really the godfather of this entire process and has been for the last twenty years, uh, and also. Uh, my co-conveners Tanya, Piers, and uh, Andrew online, and lastly, all of you for actually coming up to what I thought would be the most unpopular workshop in the whole of Tad Week. So thank you. Thanks, Cam. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. <laughs>